Hi everyone, in this video from Count Backwards from 10, we're going to take a look at ventilator liberation, specifically the difference between liberation and weaning, the weaning parameters, and ways by which we test to ensure that the patient is ready to be liberated from the ventilator. This is in the ICU and in the operating room. So let's get started. Now, the first thing I do want to note about this is do not overthink. Um, you're going to get pimped on this sometimes. They're going to ask you in the ICU. You know, your uh, attendings in the operating room might ask you. Uh, it's exactly what you think it's going to be. So don't overthink it. And, you know, I'll make a couple of points as we go through this. And you'll be like, oh, yeah, of course. That makes a lot of sense. So going through this, the first thing we need to do is we need to establish if the underlying cause for the need for artificial ventilation has been resolved. Again, seems silly and I'm, I'm reiterating don't overthink this because it really is as simple as that meaning in the operating room for example is the surgery over do they still need to be intubated and have a um, ventilator breathing through them are they paralyzed anymore you know in the ICU uh, are they able to protect their airway uh, perhaps they had seizures and altered mental status and they weren't able to breathe for themselves in that way because of risk of aspiration. Perhaps it was a patient with hypoxic respiratory failure from a CHF exacerbation that has been appropriately diuresed and had the fluid cleared from their lungs. Again, it seems silly, but the first part of a liberation assessment is, did we reverse the cause for initial requirement for intubation? Because if we haven't, we can't extubate. Because if we do, it's likely they're going to require reintubation. Next, we need to ensure is there adequate gas exchange. So what does that mean? What it really means is are they oxygenating appropriately with an appropriate CO2? So is their pH greater than 7.25? Can they tolerate less than eight centimeters H2O of PEEP? Is their FiO2 requirement less than 50%? And with all of these settings, is their PaO2 at least 60 millimeters of mercury? If so, we've passed another one of our tests. If not, it means there is some underlying pathology that's inhibiting the patient from adequately exchanging gases. Now, our baseline air pressure exerts about five centimeters of water pressure in the form of PEEP. And our air is 21% oxygen. As such, if a patient can't tolerate settings of, like I mentioned, 50% O2 and a PEEP of less than eight, it's unlikely that they're going to be able to tolerate room air. Now, we do give a little bit of slack because breathing through a tube, if any of you have ever tried, can be very difficult, and you do need some pressure support to get through that sometimes to take adequate volumes. But the overall message is, if you're not tolerating 50% oxygen, you're not going to tolerate 21% oxygen. If you need more than eight centimeters of water of PEEP, you're not going to tolerate five for room air. So, so far we've covered, did we reverse the underlying need for the ventilation? Yes or no? And is the patient adequately exchanging gas on minimal vent settings? Next, we need to know, are they hemodynamically stable? Now it is true, some people may require small amounts of pressors or small amounts of inotropic support and can still be extubated and that's okay. What I'm talking about is patient, patients say maxed out on levofed who are getting a second pressure who really could decompensate at any minute. And this should be obvious that if there's a chance or a risk that the patient decompensates acutely that they would have to be reintubated. So as a result, patients who are hemodynamically unstable or tenuous should not be extubated. 
even if they pass a weaning trial, because it's very high likelihood that if they do acutely decompensate, they are going to have to be reintubated anyway. Fourth is, and it may seem silly, can the patient breathe on their own? Now, there's a lot that goes into this, and it is slightly more in depth than just initiating a breath that we need to be able to assess the patient's inspiratory strength and their ability to really breathe on their own. So how do we do this? Well, we do it with a spontaneous breathing trial, or for short, an SBT, which many of you in the ICU have heard. And even in the operating room, we make sure that they're breathing on their own. Now, in a separate video, we will get into the various types of SBTs and their pros and cons. Um, but for now, in the intent of the video, we need to establish uh, that the patient is able to breathe for themselves. And this can be done with the use of a T-piece, which is basically where the patient just breathes with oxygen coming into the tube on one side, and then they breathe out through the other side. Um, we can put them on what's called pressure support which is where anytime they initiate a breath, the ventilator helps by giving them a little bit of extra pressure to help them really take that breath. Um, and there are a number of other ways to go ahead and do this, but the take home message is that, can the patient breathe for themselves? And we're usually going to do this for about 30 minutes to 120 minutes. And this is to ensure, and depending on how long they've been intubated for, that the patient has the strength and duration to continue to breathe for themselves. Because if somebody would be extubated and then would soon tire out, or their tidal volume start to fall, whatever it might be, again, it may be the case that they may have to be reintubated. Now, there's two other things that you're going to see looked at, and they are the RSBI, or the Rapid Shallow Breathing Index shallow breathing index. And this is part of the SBT. You know, we're going to look at how many times they're breathing or their breath frequency over their tidal volume in uh, liters. And it's going to be done within the first minute of them starting. And what we're looking for here is a ratio of greater than, oh, I'm sorry, of less than 105. And basically what that translates to is if they're breathing, say, at 10 breaths a minute, and they're taking tidal volumes of one liter, it would mean that they have an RSBI of 10, which is very good. But if you're breathing at 30 times a minute and you're only taking tidal volumes of 300, it means that your RSBI is higher and you have a higher chance of requiring reintubation. Now, the other thing you're going to see looked at is the NIF or the negative inspiratory force. And what this is a, is a measure of our respiratory muscle strength. So, you know, the patient is basically going to take a breath against, not a closed, but a, a system that allows it to measure how much negative pressure they're creating when their diaphragm drops during a breath. And if they have a NIF of less than minus 30 centimeters of water, it means that they're able to generate a sufficient amount of force with their diaphragm to create that large kind of vacuum negative pressure. And then they can be uh, liberated from their ventilator. So that's all for the basics of ventilator liberation in the ICU. Um, and as always, if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to write in. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. If you want to get involved, we'd also love to hear from you. Follow us on Instagram, account backwards from 10 follow or subscribe below and stay tuned for the next video.